Right, hello everybody. Hopefully you can all hear me and see me and hopefully you can see my presentation. Um, if someone wouldn't mind just popping into the chat quickly actually that you can see all that, that would be really helpful. Great, thanks Rosie. Okay, uh, so welcome to this training session on Great Crested Newts, aka GCN. Um, I hope you find it helpful. I've tried to make it as broad as possible without going into too much detail. Um, so hopefully I found the right balance and it's informative, but not dull, hopefully. Right, I'm just going to stop my video because you don't need to see me and it's quite distracting. <laughs> okay, and we'll make a start. Uh, so I'm going to cover UK and amphibians, sort of general ecology, um, ID, threats, that kind of thing. Then we'll look at legal protection and licensing, survey techniques, and then mitigation. If anyone has any questions, any point, just pop it in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on it, but um, I'll probably answer questions at the end. Hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties. Right, so in the UK we have seven um, native amphibians. You're likely to find five of them in your sort of day-to-day -day work. So that's the common frog, common toad, smooth newt, palmate newt, and great crested newt. There are a couple of, of populations of nastrack toads in Surrey. That picture is actually from Frencham a couple of years ago. Um, but you're unlikely to find any pool frogs. They went extinct in the 90s. There's been a couple of reintroductions, I think, in Norfolk, and I think Kent, um, but you're not going to get them around here. Just a quick note on copyright. I've tried to use all my own pictures and videos throughout, but on this slide, the, the newt pictures and the pool frog are from um, Frog Life. Um, I wanted to show you newts in the water and I didn't have any. Okay, so let's move on to ID. Uh, we're looking at newts um, because our main concern today is GCN. So the main way to tell the difference between GCN and the other two newts is size. Um, GCN are almost double the size. Um, they're also very black, or at least they tend to be. There's always an exception to the rule. Um, a couple of years ago, I found a population in a kind of a clay pit, um, and they were a real sandy colour um, because the water was just, well, a sandy clay colour. There was no macrophytes or anything, so I think it was just um, as a, a response to their surroundings. But usually they are very black and warty. They have an orange underside with black spots. The male has a big crest and a silver flash along his tail. Um, the female doesn't have these, but she has an orange base to her tail. I'm going to show you some videos in a minute, so don't worry, it's not going to be just me talking at you. Um, and then just a quick note on the smooth newt and the palmate newt. So the, the male smooth newt also has a crest and a little bit of a flash on the tail. It, it's not as prominent as, as the great crested newt. Um, and he's got you know really prominent black spots on him. He's sort of a brown colour. Whereas the palmate newt doesn't really have a crest, but he has these big black webbed hind feet, um, which are really obvious. And he also has a filament at the end of the tail, sort of a bit of a pintail. Um, that can get bitten off by predators. So you'll quite often find them with only a little bit of a short stub, um, but the black feet are a giveaway. The females of the two species, the smooth and the palmate, are very similar. They're both kind of a dull brown colour. And the way to tell the difference is to turn them over and then on the underside, the, um, the female smooth newt will have spots under her chin, um, usually. So sometimes she doesn't. If she doesn't, have a look at the quality of the skin. So if it's quite an opaque colour, then you're pretty sure you've got a smooth newt. The palmate newt doesn't have any spots under her chin and um, she's got quite translucent colours, like a pinky colour. So I'm going to show you some videos. Um, they're not the best videos, but hopefully they're going to be more interesting than me talking at you. These were taken a couple of years ago. Right, so here we have a male great crested newt. As you can see, it's much larger than the smooth or the palmate, almost spanning the entirety of my hand. And they have this really nice silver flash down their tail. He also has a crest that you can't really see at the moment. It's much better in the water but the crest goes along the tail and then dips at the base of the back and then you can see it along the back there as well but it has flopped right over because he's on my hand. Okay so here we have a female GCN as you can see once again 
quite large, spanning the, the entirety of my hand. She's got an orange stripe going along the base of her tail and she lacks the silver flashing that the male had and she also lacks the crest that the male had. You see that they're both quite warty and this one in particular has got quite a few white warty spots um, which is pretty typical of great crested newts. Okay, so here we've got a comparison in size of the male GCN and the male smooth. So you can see that this, the GCN, the great crested newt, is far larger than the smooth. Um, darker in colour as well, but just overall just a much bigger newt. So we've got our male palmate here, you'll see the webbed back feet the silver flash on the tail and a really nice speckled face and I'll just show you the underside it's spotted and again he's got no spots on his throat and you can see the pin to his tail there. we have a close-up of a female palmate newt you'll see that her hind feet are not webbed and they're not dark like they are in the male. Um, she also doesn't have a long filament to the end of her tail, but she does have a slight stub of a filament that you might just be able to see on the camera. The underneath doesn't have many spots and her throat is completely clear of spots and quite translucent. Cool, so hopefully um, they were clear and useful. Uh, just a quick note on the, the bit about the palmate newt with the speckled head. Um, that's just anecdotal from things that I've seen. I can't find that anywhere in books or online or anything. So um, I don't know if that is um, sort of a, an identifying quality of the, of the male palmate newt, but it's definitely something that I've seen. All right, so let's move on to general ecology then. So amphibians spend approximately 80% of their lives on land. Most people, when they think of amphibian habitat, they think of ponds, and that's kind of all they focus on. Um, but terrestrial habitat is really, really important. Um, so we're talking things like uh, tusky grass and scrubland, woodland, log piles, anywhere that's sort of quite moist, um, has their invertebrate prey, is away from disturbance and predators. Um, so yeah, always think terrestrial habitat. Um, also metapopulations. So um, this is important to varying degrees of amphibian species, but definitely with great crested newts, they need to have a number of different populations adding to their gene pool. Um, so we're talking several ponds all connecting together through terrestrial habitat. If they don't have these metapopulations, um, then the gene pool is going to get so small that the population is not going to be viable. Generally, great crested newts will travel up to 250 metres. That's what's in the guidance, but they have been known to travel a lot further than this, so always keep that in mind. Amphibians go into brumation in the winter, which is a type of hibernation, um, generally when air temperatures are below five degrees. Um, it is worth noting at the moment with our milder winters, amphibians aren't really doing this as much, um, which is causing a little bit of concern for their general health, their general body condition, because they're not resting in the winter. Um, so I think that might have some knock on effects in the future, sort of their breeding ability. Uh, they're most active at night. They feed on a wide variety of invertebrates and their predators include fish, grass snakes, ducks and foxes. So they're breeding, they, they have um, these gelatinous eggs, but if they, if they laid them on land, they would just dry up and die. So they do have to have a pond for, for breeding. They have two different methods of breeding. So frogs and toes are, are known as explosive breeders. So they lay these sort of clumps and strings of eggs um, over a very brief period, sort of a week or two in the pond, and then they leave. Whereas newts are known as protractive breeders. So they lay an, egg at, uh, lay, lay an egg at a time and then they wrap each egg in a leaf um, so that it's safe from predation. So they can be in the pond for several weeks, if not months. The larvae then hatch um, after several weeks and metamorphosis takes place. Um, and then the mini adults leave the pond. Sometimes they will stay in the pond over winter if they're a little bit late in this metamorphosis period. 
um, but then they will leave the following spring um, and then they spend two to three years on land before they return to the breeding pond to breed. Um, so that's just another example of just how important terrestrial habitat is for amphibians. So we'll just cover a few of the, of the threats to UK amphibians. The main one is habitat loss and fragmentation. So particularly in our line of work, if say a development comes along and they want to build a housing estate between a pond and terrestrial habitat, um, you know, your, your amphibians aren't going to be able to get to the pond to breed or they're not going to be able to get to terrestrial habitat for their, their food and, and refuge. So um, that's going to kill off the population very quickly. Pollution is another concern. So amphibians have uh, permeable skin, so they're really susceptible to toxins in the water or direct contact with their skin. Um, so it's worth noting just here, if you are going to put refuge on land um, for amphibian surveys or for reptile surveys, just make sure you're not using anything with any kind of adhesives, you know, sort of glues and things, because if it gets really wet and soggy, they can dissolve and then get into contact with the amphibian and they can kill them. Another threat is non-native species. So we've brought seven non-native species into this country that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and they impact on native species to varying degrees, some of them not so much, and then some of them a lot. Um, and that's through predation, carrying disease, interbreeding and uh, habitat and food competition. And then we have two diseases in this country. We have rhinovirus and we have chytrid fungus. Rhinovirus has proved quite devastating, um, in particular for common frog populations. So if you find a, a frog with a bloody nose, then that's probably what it's got. Chytrid fungus, as far as I'm aware, it's, it's not causing as much of a problem in the UK um, that we know of at the moment, but um, research is ongoing. So watch this space. Right, the law. So great crested newts and mastrack toads are European protected species. They are listed on Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, Burn Convention Appendix 2, and they are UK bat priority species. This means that it is illegal to impact their eggs, breeding sites and resting places, and the adults, obviously. Um, so um, they, they have protection from things like developments and things that would otherwise impact their populations. Um, it is illegal to survey for Great Crested Newts without a survey license, though. So if you're interested in getting your license, then um, join your local ARG group or, you know, volunteer with us, get some experience with us and then apply to Natural England for your license. You will need a reference from someone who um, can vouch for you. And just a quick note on common toads, although they're not um, protected as such, they're UK Biodiversity Action Plan species. So um, that means that they're recognised as being threatened um, and that they need some conservation action to help conserve them. Right, so licensing. At the moment, we have European Protected Species licenses in West Sussex anyway. Um, so this means that if, say, for example, the development was going to impact a pond, um, you'd need to assess that pond for its suitability for GCN. If you think it's suitable, you'd need to do some surveys. Um, and if you find great crested newts and the development definitely has to impact the pond, then you need to apply for a license to Natural England. Um, and that license needs to include your avoidance measures and your mitigation measures to make sure that there is no negative impact on that population. Now, we've got district licensing coming into force across the country. It's not here yet, um, but I think it probably will be by next year. Um, and it's proved to be quite controversial. Some people have dubbed it as a license to kill. Um, because basically what it means is, is there's um, the, the owner of the land, the, the client, they have no obligation to put in any kind of mitigation um, or avoidance measures. They just need to apply for their district license. If they get it, they pay a sum of money for um, off-site pond and habitat creation and their pond on site, they can do whatever they want with. They don't have to do any surveys and they don't have to do any mitigation. So the way I'm trying to look at this is you just need to try and plead with your developer, really, um, you know, tell them, you know, goodwill, good press. It would be really good if they do do the mitigation, even though they don't have to do it. And it doesn't have to be really expensive. You don't have to go for all the trapping out and the surveys. You could just say, um, you know, let's have a watching brief while you, you empty the pond. 
use a pump with a filter and then if we find any amphibians or other animals um, then we'll take them out and we'll take them to, uh, to another site to a receptor site. Um, I think as long as you put in some kind of avoidance measures or mitigation then district licensing is a good thing because they are creating a lot of off-site habitat um, hopefully it's going to prove to be successful. Uh, it needs some research to make sure that their creation is actually working, that, you know, their pond and habitat creation is working. But it could be a good thing. I'm trying to stay optimistic about it. All right, so let's move on to survey techniques. So first thing you need to do is you need to assess your pond to see if you think it's suitable for great crested newts. So we have this habitat suitability index. You might have also seen it abbreviated to HSI assessment. Um, it's worth noting that there is always an exception to the rule. So this assessment is, you know, your standard, what a typical pond would be with great, great crested newts in it. Um, but great crested newts, you, you can find them anywhere. You know, they've been found in swimming pools. Like I said, I found them in clay pit. They don't necessarily follow the rules. But generally, we use this HSI assessment to look at 10 criteria. So number one, you have location. Uh, so down here in the southeast, we're very likely to have great crested newts. So we always score a one straight away for location. And you've got size, you've got water quality. It's worth noting with water quality, that doesn't mean how clear the water is. Um, it means how many invertebrates are in the water. So if you imagine putting a net into the pond, and then, you know, do you think you're going to come out with a whole load of swarming invertebrates? Or do you think you're just going to come out with a whole load of, of dead leaves? Um, macrophytes, you can see this top right one, we've got some water plantain, uh, potamogeton, got some submerged macrophytes, so that's really good, um, whereas the bottom right one, we don't have any macrophytes at all. Shade, fish, uh, fish will predate, um, particularly on the larvae and the eggs, um, so GCN will tend to avoid fish ponds. Um, if there's lots of macrophytes around the pond or, you know, places for them to hide, then they will be there quite happily. So you can't you can't um, rule it out. Um, but generally, it's a good indicator. Um, just as a side note, toads will quite often be in fish ponds because their larvae have toxins. So they're not so bothered about the fish. Waterfowl, obviously, they'll predate on amphibians. Um, Surrounding terrestrial habitat, we've already talked about that. So it's really important to have good terrestrial habitat. You could have a brilliant pond you know, surrounded by concrete or, you know, a vast area of immunity grassland, you're unlikely to have, um, you know, great crested newts or, or any amphibians. Does it dry up at any time of year? So it's actually quite good if it dries up because it means um, it's less likely to have fish in it. Um, and then number of surrounding ponds. So again, we're just going back to the meta populations and um, it's really good to have a number of surrounding ponds. Right, let's move on to survey techniques. So we survey for GCN in the breeding season, so mid-March to mid-June, and there are a number of techniques you can use. Um, first of all, you could just use eDNA sampling. So you just take a water sample from the pond, you send it off to the lab, and, and they tell you in a week or two whether you've got any GCN DNA in that pond. And that can be a quite good way of ruling out the ponds. So you can, you know, if it's at the beginning of the season, you can do your eDNA analysis, if it comes back negative, that's it, you can tell the client it's fine, you don't have to do any more. But if your client comes to you quite late in the season and then asks for an eDNA, um, then you, you can sort of run out of time because if eDNA, eDNA comes back positive, then you might not have time to then do the surveys. So we don't always do eDNA or sometimes we do it in conjunction with starting the presence absence surveys. Right, so you've got your torching. So that is literally just going to a pond at night and using a bright torch to have a look to see if there's any newts in the pond. Great crested newts are quite distinctive because they're so large. So it, it is a really effective way of just establishing a simple presence absence. Visual search, so that's looking for eggs. So you see on the right hand side, we've got a GCN egg. It's really quite white. Um, whereas the smooth newt and the palmate newt, they're quite hard to tell apart, but they both have kind of a brownie gray egg and, and they're both very different from the great crested newt. Then we move on to bottle trapping, which you're probably all aware of. Um, there's an image of a bottle trap, top right hand corner. Um, and literally it's just a, a two litre bottle that's got a cane going through it which then is in the ground of the, of the pond um, and then the top has been cut off and inverted to create a funnel. The great crested goes in and then it can't go out. Um, so you can see that it's at a slant that means that there's an air bubble at the top of the bottle. Um, 
there are issues with the bottle trapping. Um, there is quite a high risk of mortality. So um, if you don't get there till later on in the morning and it's a hot day, then they can get heat stress and they can literally cook in there. Um, they can also suffocate. So it's quite surprising sometimes how many you'll find in one bottle. Um, and if you have too many, and then they'll just run out of air. Um, and then you can have interference from other people so they can come along and find a bottle in the pond and think, oh, what's this? Take it out. And then who knows what they do with it. So there are issues with the bottle traps. Um, I haven't personally had any yet, but I have heard of them. We quite often use an alternative. So you can see in the top of the image, there is a net there. Um, it's a foldable net. I think it's actually used for crabs. Um, it's basically just got two, an entrance and an exit. And it's just like a funnel. And it works really, really well. Um, the only thing is it's not within the guidance from Natural England. So there is a chance that the county ecologist could turn around and say, no, we're not accepting these results. We've never had that and we've used it quite a lot. So that they tend to be happy with it. Um, but more research definitely needs to be done. It'd be really good if it was included within the guidance. Um, and then all you do is you just you put that in. You can either put it in the deep end of the pond or you can put it around the edges. I actually do a mix. It's quite good to get a mix. Um, and you put some polystyrene in there to keep it afloat. And then just the same as bottle traps, you put it in, in the evening and then you come back the following morning and you check it. And usually it's really successful. There's usually quite a bit in there. And then lastly, we've got the pitfall trapping. So this is normally if you establish that there is a population of GCN on site and you need to take them out. Um, so if a pond's going to be impacted by development, for example, um, you would then fence the site with impermeable fencing. I'm sure you've all seen our reptile fencing we use. Um, and then you put buckets in the ground and then the, the GCN, they fall in. You go and check them first thing in the morning and then take them off to site. Again, this one has its mortality risks. So the, the newts or amphibians or whatever else goes in there, um, it can get heat stress, it can desiccate, um, or it can drown, um, or it can be predated upon. Um, so it's really important that you're checking them frequently. How many surveys do you need to do? So for presence absence, so just to, to say that there's likely no GCN in that pond, you would do four surveys. If after four surveys you haven't found anything, then you know the county college is going to be pretty happy that there's none in there. Um, for population size assessments, you need to do six, and at least three of these need to be between mid-April and mid-May, sort of like the, the peak breeding season. Um, and then you can work out your populations from small, medium, or large really important to consider disease prevention when doing any kind of surveys um, anything that comes into contact with the water or with amphibians needs to be cleaned before you then put it into another pond um, so we use a dilute bleach solution you don't want it to be too strong and you want to make sure that you wash it off thoroughly because bleach is obviously toxic to amphibians but you need to make sure that you wash everything and scrub everything um, that includes your wellies bottles nets gloves and it is good practice to wear gloves where possible. Right, so um, mitigation, I'm not going to go into too much detail with the mitigation because we could be here for another hour. Um, but just to give you a rough idea, um, so say, for example, we've got an EPS license for a pond that's going to be impacted um, and there are great crested newts in there. Um, we'd need to trap them all out. Um, I mean, first of all, you want to try and approach the developer for avoidance if you can. So if you can, you know, if the, if the developer is willing to go around the pond rather than to impact it, great. Um, if not, if they definitely need to impact it, then you get your EPS license, you trap out all the newts. And you need to create habitat either on site or off site before you do the trapping so that then you're taking them somewhere that's suitable. We always try and get net gain. So um, that means um, rather than replacing, say, a moderate pond with moderate terrestrial habitat with, with like for like, we would replace the moderate pond with really good pond, you know, filled with macrophytes and surrounded by really good terrestrial habitat. So you always want to aim for net gain if you can. And then it's important to do follow up surveys to make sure that your mitigation, your, your habitat creation has worked. If it hasn't worked, you then need to amend it to make sure that there's definitely no negative impact on that population. Um, we are talking here about your EPS license. District licensing is different, as I said before. 
you don't need to do mitigation necessarily. It's not a legal requirement. All right, and then lastly, just further reading, um, Frog Life and Arc Trust have got a really good website, so I really recommend going on there. Um, if you prefer your books, I really recommend these two books. They are just brilliant. Um, I'm sure there's more books out there. But these are the two I have, and they're great. Trevor Beebe, he's done loads of research papers, if you're interested in that. Um, and his book has got some really good ideas on research and, and terrestrial surveys as well. Um, but also the British Reptiles and Amphibians by Howard Inns is great and that's supported by Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Um, if you want to get experience, I'd really recommend joining your local ARG group, so that's Amphibian and Reptile Group, and join your local Toad Patrol. So they're just starting up at the moment, it's a really good time to have a look and see if there's a Toad Patrol near you and go out there and, and rescue some toads. Um, other than that, uh, try and get some shadowing experience with us. At the moment, we've got COVID restrictions, obviously, but hopefully once they're lifted, um, then we can invite you out so you can come and do some actual practical surveys. OK, so that's the, the end of my presentation. Um, I can't see any questions, which is a nice relief. <laughs> I will give you a minute to just quickly write some, some questions if you have any. Otherwise, we will end it there. Okay, great. I don't think anyone's got any questions. Um, so that's very kind. Um, I, hope, I hope that was interesting. I hope it was informative. Um, if you do think of any questions afterwards, then feel free to drop me an email um, or ring me. I'm sure I think most of you have got my number. All right, well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining and um, have a good weekend, everybody.